Okay. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's the uh, it's two o'clock. So that's time of the day. Whoops, so Daisy. We don't want me in echo mode, do we? Um, hello, hello, Ben, Megan, uh, Benyon, Missy, Hadia. How are you all doing? Good to see you guys back and ready for some more chemistry. Um, how are we all feeling, guys? We uh, we settling in maybe to uh, to doing some home studying. How's it all working out for you guys? You just bring this mic a little bit closer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really weird, isn't it? I mean, you take for granted leaving the house. I mean, you know, working uh, from home like I do as well, it's, uh, you know, I don't leave the house that much anyway, but it's kind of like, hmm, it's all a bit weird, isn't it? But there we go. Oh, thanks very much, Ruhab. Uh, hi, Mohammed, uh, Shanketha, Lucy. Um, yeah, let's go. I mean, we have got hella stuff to get through today and uh, periodicity is a massive massive topic so i think we should probably just get cracking so uh who was able who managed to access some of those um content guide videos because like yesterday don't forget we're kind of opening up parts of the content guide that we've been talking about for the next 24 hours after we've done this live um so hopefully you guys managed to find your way over to that. You can, you can use any of the buttons in the first section of the course, uh, the examulance, and click on your exam guide. Uh, click on your exam board, and it'll take you to the content guide, and uh, you can access the um, uh, the videos that you need. So that's what I've done today. I've opened up the uh, taken down the ones from yesterday. I've given you access to the uh, group two, the periodist, the periodist, the group two and group seven stuff that we're going to be talking about today, uh, and you can access those for the next twenty four hours just to consolidate your learning make sure you've covered everything in the spec okay so you can always uh, in the examulance just click the um uh the button for your exam board and you can access those materials after the live class so um who's new who hasn't been in here before that's what i'd like to know welcome if you are um as i say our mission in life right now is just to help all you year 12s finish the spec um and of course if you've got any year 13s in here then you're welcome as well just to kind of consolidate your knowledge but of course there's so much in periodicity we're going to cover the major headlines today okay so obviously if you want detail then you can access um you know the the, the really important videos in the course we haven't given you access to everything but we're just unlocking parts of it each day so you can um uh, basically just access the information you need to complete your notes because obviously you need to make sure you're finished ready for next year so um let's crack on shall we so periodicity essentially okay that is the art of knowing the trends and stuff in the periodic table uh for your exam all right so that's really really important of course uh so this is what we're talking about here um so i'll just bring up my red pen here so all the things we're going to try and talk about today are all these different things here that relate to trends in the periodic table so on and so forth okay so we're going to talk about uh, group two and group seven, um, a little bit about period three as well. Ionization energy is massively important, electronegativity, different radii and stuff like that. So just to make sure we understand what the trends are and why we get those trends, which is really, really important. So what I've got here is just a really kind of basic outline of a periodic table. So let's start with something nice and easy. OK, let's start with uh, atomic structure. No, before we do that, how is the periodic table organized? Well, of course, everything, we go from one to whatever it goes to uh, in terms of atomic number, all right? But then they're grouped into, uh, obviously, into groups that have similar uh, physical and chemical properties. So that's why, uh, that's how we've developed the structure of the periodic table. And in terms of atomic structure, um, Obviously, we've got, we know our electronic structure. We covered that yesterday. So every time you go down a period, you're increasing in a uh, energy level. Every time you go across the periodic table, looking at the groups, you add an extra electron to that uh, outer energy level. Yeah, increase in atomic number, uh, T-boy. So I'll tell you what, atomic radius. Now, what happens when, I'll tell you what, let's get some arrows on the go here. Uh, what happens when, if I use green, let's just do green. So if we're going across the periodic table, like so, um, and I think what we can do, start end color, let's do that. Um, atomic radius, what happens to atomic radius going from left to right across the periodic table? I'm looking for one of two words, increases or decreases, ladies and gentlemen. So what's that? 
decreases Tommy radius across a period. Tommy radius decreases, decreases. Yeah, we're all on the same page here. So the reason why that decreases is that the um, they all have electrons in the same outer energy level. So they're not increasing in energy level, but you are increasing your nuclear charge. And what that does is that draws the outer electrons in. So increasing nuclear charge, no extra shielding, outer electrons are drawn in, so atomic radius decreases. Absolutely, thank you, Katie, perfectly put. So, you, you know, it's, it's all about using key terms here, charge in a nucleus, no extra shielding, um, uh, attraction to outer electrons is greater, so uh, obviously the radius gets smaller. What about going down a group? What happens to atomic radius going down a group, guys? Increase or decrease, that's all I'm looking for. Boom, that's it, absolutely. And again, we are getting an increase in nuclear charge, of course, going down there, but we are adding an energy level, a full energy level of electrons each time. So that outweighs the increase in nuclear charge. So why do we get an increase? It's because we're adding extra, uh, energy level, full energy levels of electrons, thus increasing the atomic radius. Awesome, right. What about, what about, what about um, electronegativity? So going from left to right across the periodic table, what happens to electronegativity? Increases, good, okay, absolutely increases. So the reason for that increase is the same as we just discussed, increase in nuclear charge, no extra shielding, so they are better at attracting a bonding pair of electrons, okay? Because that's what electronegativity is. It's about the, the attraction of a bonding pair of electrons. Our top three, of course, are nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Fluorine having the highest electronegativity of all the elements, okay? We ignore our uh, noble gases. We know group eight because they tend not to form covalent bonds, okay? So... Uh, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, highly electronegative. Of course, that's where we get into hydrogen bonding and stuff like that as well. But increase in electronegativity is the same reason um, for the decrease in, in atomic radius, isn't it? High nuclear charge, low amount of shielding, so therefore a high attraction to any electrons. Of course, going down a group, what happens to electronegativity going down a group? Yeah, Ben, it's all linked, absolutely all linked. Yeah, good. Decreases as you go down a group. The reason, okay, exactly the same reason as we just said for atomic radius. So um, although you are getting an increase in nuclear charge, it's adding those extra energy levels uh, increases the amount of shielding and it decreases the attraction of the nucleus to a bonding pair of electrons. So they're really, really rubbish at attracting a bonding pair of electrons, okay? So decreasing down the group. So the last two explanations are exactly the same, exactly the same, absolutely increasing shielding. So it's all linked. Atomic structure, so, so important, okay? So let me get rid of these. Um, now, let's go with, let's go with first ionization energy, okay? So this is all linked to atomic structure again. Let's mix it up a little bit. Going down a group, what happens to first ionization energy? <laughs> uh, going down a group, guys. Good, we're all on the same page again. You guys are on it. Um, decreases, okay? Now, get this, nothing new here. As you go down a group, why do we get a decrease in first ionization energy? Well, again, it's all to do with the attraction of the nucleus to the outer electrons. So remember, it doesn't matter whether we're dealing with metals or non-metals, um, we're looking to remove an outer electron, okay? So as we go down the group, shielding increases, that decreases the attraction between the nucleus and the outer electron, okay? It's an electrostatic attraction, of course. Anything between anything positive and negative, it's an electrostatic attraction. So increase in um, shielding, increase in atomic radius. Ruhab, you're absolutely right. Um, which means there's a decrease in attraction between the nucleus and outer electrons, okay? So it's, it's basically exactly the same explanation as the last two things we discussed, okay? So lower, yeah, weaker nuclear attraction between the nucleus and the outer electron. 
therefore, and this is the drop the mic statement, therefore less energy is needed to remove it because we've got to link it to ionization energy after all, okay? So, of course, going across a period like so, what's the general trend in ionization energy going from left to right across a period? Hi, Raseb. Good. Increases. Absolutely. And again, we've got the same explanation. We've got um, stronger nuclear charge, same amount of shielding, okay, decreasing atomic radius, we may as well put that in there. Therefore, a stronger attraction between the nucleus and outer electron, and therefore more energy is needed to uh, to remove it. Okay. So the thing is, the last three things we discussed, the reasons behind them, atomic radius, electronegativity, and ionization energy, all of the explanations are exactly the same. That's why it's so, so important. You've got a really good handle on your... Um, uh, on your knowledge of atomic structure, okay? Really, really important. T-boy, perfect, absolutely perfect. Um, now, we gotta talk exceptions, all right? We've got to talk exceptions. So I'll tell you what, let's go on to this. So our first exceptions are between beryllium and boron and magnesium and aluminium, okay? Let's do beryllium and boron, four and five. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. So for beryllium and boron, all right, so beryllium is four, so that is 1s2, uh, 2s2, and it looks like this. And boron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. So, of course, we've got this here. Oops. Oop, what am I doing? Too many electrons, like so, okay? It does, periodicity links, a, to, links to a, so much other stuff in chemistry. So what we get is we've got from lithium to beryllium and then to boron and then to the next one, okay? So why do we get this decrease here? Okay, so this is beryllium and this is boron, okay? So beryllium and boron. So why is boron lower than beryllium? Higher IE for beryllium because 2SO was already full, hard to remove the electron from the overly stable orbital. Mm, not quite. Good, Miss C. That's more like it. Okay. So we want to get away from full or half full orbitals are more stable. That's not, it, it's part of the reason, but it's not the main reason. The main reason is this you've got your 1S orbital here. You've got your 2s orbital here, and then you've got your 2p orbital. In fact, I'll do that in a different color. Um, you've got your 2p orbital like this, okay? So it's outside, okay? So this s orbital, this 2s orbital, shields the 2p orbital and makes that one easier to remove than that one, okay? So that's our explanation. So it's, the, it's not a change in energy level. They're all in the same energy level, energy level 2, but even within an energy level, because we know one energy level shields another one, but one orbital can shield another one because the orbitals are higher and lower in energy. They're like sub, they're like sub energy levels, aren't they? Okay. So within energy level two, we have two different types of orbital, the S and the P. And the S orbital here is shielding this electron from the nucleus, albeit by, albeit by a small amount. So the S, so just like if we had, um, you know, we could say, oh, we're trying to remove an electron in the third energy level. Well, there's two energy levels below it, shielding it from the nucleus, making it easier to remove. So increased shielding means a lower ionization energy, right? And it's the same here, but we're talking on an orbital level as opposed to an energy level. So the reason why boron has a lower first ionization energy than beryllium is because the S2 orbital or the 2S2 orbital shields the P electron from the nucleus and therefore um, uh, makes it a lower ionization energy. So it's easier to remove. There's a weaker attraction, okay? So just like we said, going down a group, when you add energy levels, there's more shielding, easier to remove. In these, in these uh, exceptions, okay, 
um, we have got shielding, but orbital shielding, not energy level shielding. So energy level is like the full energy level, right? Okay, so that's what I mean. Of course, the exact same uh, explanation is for magnesium and aluminium. Okay, so if they ask you, why is aluminium lower than magnesium? Well, this time it's the 3S and 3P orbitals that are doing the same thing. So your explanation is exactly the same. The S orbital shields the P orbital where the outer electron is from the nucleus. So there's a weaker attraction and less energy is required to remove it. So that's why we get that dip between magnesium and aluminium as well. So what are other exceptions? Let's just get rid of this. Um, what are other exceptions? Well, they are um, nitrogen and oxygen and phosphorus and sulfur, okay? So, so I'm just catching up on the comments. So let's do nitrogen and oxygen, okay? So that is seven and eight. So we've got nitrogen and oxygen here. So nitrogen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And oxygen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So again, we've got this change, okay? We go from uh, nitrogen down to oxygen. Whoops. And then that goes up again, okay? So we've got this exception going on, going across the uh, period. Oh, absolutely, Zed. This is, this is for everybody, absolutely everybody. So the reason here, okay, I'm just going to, they've both got full 1S and 2S orbitals, okay? So the 2P3 for uh, nitrogen and the 2P4 for oxygen. One, two, three. Hun's rule, don't forget. One, two, three. I'm going to do this one in red, because that's the one we need to remove. So why is that one in red for oxygen easier to remove than the one um, in red for nitrogen? Boom. Mimi and Shalane, Benyon, absolutely. It's down to repulsion. So when you've got this pair of electrons together in the same orbital, they do have a bit of repulsion, okay? Because they're both negatively charged, okay? So T-boy, it's not to do with shielding here, okay? So electrons repel. So why has oxygen got a lower first ionization than, um, than nitrogen? Well, oxygen has a 2p4 um, orbital, okay? And you can show, use the electrons in boxes. No reason why you can't use a diagram as part of your answer. So this electron here is easier to remove because of repulsion, whereas this one here isn't paired up, so there's no repulsion, so it's more difficult to remove, okay? And again, just like in the previous example, that explanation there, why oxygen is lower than nitrogen, why is it an exception, is the same explanation between phosphorus and sulfur, except here you're um, talking about the 3s2, 3p4, and 3s2, uh, 3p3, okay? So you're just talking about a different energy level, exactly the same reason, okay? Now, those explanations we've just talked about, down a group, across a period, and these exceptions, okay? The exceptions kind of stand out on their own, don't they? But down a group, we can literally pick any two elements in any any group, okay? And we can apply our explanation, okay? So they could ask you, why has bromine got a lower first ionization energy than chlorine? Well, going down the group, you've got increased shielding, increased atomic radius, outer electrons further away from the nucleus, weaker attraction between the nucleus and outer electron, therefore um, less energy needed to remove it. Of course, if they asked you, why has chlorine got a higher first ionization energy than bromine? So if they flip the question, you just flip your answer. It's like a stock answer you can use for anything, okay? Thank you, Mimi, that's what I'm here for. I like to, simple is as simple does. That's, that's that I'm sure I've heard that somewhere. Was it Forrest Gump or something? I don't know, but um, it's, it's, it's just a very simple explanation, okay? And I, they could ask you, you know, why is gallium lower than aluminium? Why is strontium lower than beryllium? You know, if they're in the same group, you've got a stock answer to put in there. It's a walk in the park. And of course, going across a period as well, you know, why is uh, fluorine higher than oxygen, for example? Or why is neon higher than fluorine? 
you've got your stock answer. Okay, so going across a period, then um, you know stronger nuclear charge, no extra shielding, smaller atomic radius, therefore increased uh, attraction between the nucleus and outer electron, therefore more energy required to do it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. A levels made simple. Okay, so. Um, those are your three explanations. Now, again, atomic structure accounts for so, so, so many things. Okay, so, so, so many things. For example, all right, let's think about this. We all know what happens to reactivity going down group one, reactivity, which, which is the most reactive group one element. Yeah, francium, okay, or francium, whatever you want to call it. OK, so reactivity increases. Now, let's have a think about why. What happens to the outer electron when group one react? What happens to the outer electron? It's lost. Absolutely. It loses an electron. When metals react, they form positive ions, right? So they lose electrons. OK, absolutely. So. Now we know why there's an increase in reactivity. Let's take it into A-level territory, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, let's take it into A. So it's all linked. Ah, oh, George, it's like, ah, see, I love that. That's great. Um, let's link it to A-level now. Reactivity is a bit of a dirty term, isn't it? Okay, we, we need to talk in terms of redox. So what happens to metals when they react? They lose an electron, so therefore they are being... What is the question? Good, they're being oxidized. So as you go down the group, they're more easily oxidized because uh, increased shielding, increased atomic radius, weaker attraction between the nuclear and outer electron, therefore it loses it really easily. Therefore, it's being oxidized really, really easily. So what can we say about francium? Okay, that gets oxidized the easiest so we can call it a reducing agent, can't we? We're delving into redox a little bit here. But if it's oxidized really easily, what can that what what does that tell you about how powerful it is as an as a reducing agent? What does that tell you about how powerful it is as a reducing agent? Good is the strongest reducing agent because redox, it's a game of two halves, isn't it? If something loses its electron really easily, that means it's really willing to give that electron to something else and reduce that something else, okay? That's it, okay? Yeah, absolutely very powerful. I don't know why that did that, but okay. So it's really, really important that you understand that link, okay? If it's oxidized really easily, that means it's a really strong reducing agent. If it's reduced really easily, it's a really strong oxidizing agent, okay? So think of it like that. OK, taking electrons, giving electrons. It's all about atomic structure, ladies and gentlemen. OK, so in that respect, OK, in that respect, let's look at group seven over here. Group seven tend to gain electrons when they react. We all know fluorine is the um, the most reactive group seven elements. But why? Why is fluorine the um, strongest oxidizing agent? Not because it's most electronegative, okay? It is, but it's not the reason why it's, a, the, the underlying reason behind that. Yeah, good, because it gains electrons, because it's reduced really, really easily, okay? Thereby, it's the strongest oxidizing agent. It's got the lowest shielding, okay? So let's summarize this really, really quickly, okay? Using fluorine as an example, all right? Why has fluorine, okay, so why is fluorine uh, highly electronegative? Why is it really reactive? Why is it a really, um, uh, why is it really easily oxidized? Why is it a strong reducing agent? All of those questions, those four questions, why is it highly electronegative? Why is it the most reactive? Why is it um, the most easily reduced, okay? And why is it a really strong oxidizing agent? The answer is uh, high nuclear charge, low amount of shielding, strong attraction between the nucleus and outer electrons. Okay, 
Oh, it's gone all blurry. Maybe it's the 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 feed. Okay, YouTube's been having a bit of a wobble lately, and actually, Zoom, the program we always use for lives and stuff like that, is being used by people right across the country to have like drinking sessions and stuff like that because nobody's able to meet up. So maybe that's it. Okay, um, so periodicity, we've got lots and lots to cover, so we're going to move on. Okay. So going back, so we've talked about um, general trends and things like that. Should we, we're going to talk about melting and, <laughs> yeah, can we make this a drinking session? That'd be lovely. Well, I've got a cup of coffee. There's no rum in it, but. Radius increases down group seven. So down any group radius increases because you're adding a full energy level of electrons each time. Okay. All right, Ben. So um, what should we do next? We've done ionization energies, electronegativity. We've done that. Okay, let's talk about, let's talk about group two. Yeah. Um, our aviation, are we going to call thermal stability of groups who carbonate? We can do, I suppose, but that is just for EdXL. I don't know how many EdXL peeps we got in here, okay? So I'll tell you what, we'll talk group two. So you all, depending on your exam board, need to know something different about group two. So we'll talk about the general reactions of group two, if that's okay, all right? So down group two, we know that their, um, uh, their reducing power increases. So as you go down group two, they lose the outer electrons more easily, therefore reducing other things more easily. They get more reactive, okay? Um, there are some reactions that you need to know about, okay? So let's call group two uh, X, Okay, so it's could be any group two element. So obviously we react it with um, oxygen. We're gonna get a group two oxide like so. So reaction with oxygen, we absolutely need to know that. What other reactions do we need to know for group two? I don't care which exam board you're from, just tell me. Which, which other reactions do we need to know about with group two? Hydroxides, oh yeah, we'll get, yeah, yeah. So that's group two solubility rules. We're gonna to get to that, I promise. With water, let's do with water. So with H2O, we actually get hydroxides, okay? So we end up with XOH2, okay? And uh, what else? No, we don't get anything else, it's just that, okay? Or do we? No, we don't. Okay, yeah, we're going to do acids as well. Okay, so we do end up with the um, H2O. Yeah, we're going to do with halogens as well. Yeah, loads with chlorine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so group two plus water gives the group two hydroxide and what? So the difference between the reaction of hot water and cold water remind me something about that. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So all of them give you the uh, hydroxide and hydrogen, okay? Of course, we need to balance that. Now, magnesium specifically, it will do that, but really, 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 really slowly, okay? But we can, that's liquid water. If we react that with gaseous water, so steam, Okay, what we get, because the reaction is so slow in magnesium and water, good, we get magnesium oxide. Not a bright white light raseb because that's the burning of magnesium, okay? Uh, so we get magnesium oxide and hydrogen, okay? So it's different reaction there for magnesium with water, absolutely, okay? Oh, we're going to talk about solubilities, Aisha. Don't you worry about that, okay? Next up, we've got um, X plus acid. So let's say for HCl, you get the salt, don't you? So you get XCl2 and hydrogen. If you're using HNO3, you get XNO32 and hydrogen. If you're using uh, H2SO4, you get XSO4 and H2. So these are the three acids you need to really be uh, concerning yourselves with, okay? Only EdXL really needs to know flame test colors, to be honest with you, okay? 
Um, so that's the reaction with acids as well. All right. So you are going to get, you need to be prepared to look at, um, you know, these different products of group two and their solubility. Okay. And their solubility. Um, let's talk about solubilities. I'll tell you what, let's do, there are other reactions that, of course, that you might need to know for your specific exam board, like with the halogens. I mean, they literally just form the salt. That's it. OK, so if you react it with chlorine, you're going to get, you know, magnesium chloride or calcium chloride or whatever. OK. Um, but like I said, there are specific ones you may need to know for your exam boards. But being able to construct these equations is massively important. Now. Group seven. OK, there's some really important reactions of group seven. Of course, their reaction reactivity decreases going down the group. But one thing I want to point out to you is this. OK. Oh, OCRB as well. Sorry, uh, SM of aviation. Then, uh, yes. But, you know, obviously we don't cover that, unfortunately, on the TT site. But there we go. Um, now, group seven. Let's talk about halogens and halides. OK, I want to talk to you a little bit about redox. We're going to cover this again tomorrow. But we've got F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2, and then F minus, Cl minus, Br minus, and I minus. Okay. So, what are these again? Are halogens, are they oxidizing agents or reducing agents? Same time, Maya. Two o'clock. So, are our halogens, so our elements, are they oxidizing agents or reducing agents? Good. These are oxidizing. Okay. Why? because they can gain an electron to make X minus. Okay, they're oxidizing agents. We already know that this one is the daddy. It's the top oxidizing agent because it's got a low amount of shielding, you know, high nuclear charge and, uh, you know, low distance between the nucleus and outer electrons. Therefore, it's good at gaining electrons. So it's really good oxidizing agents. What about these then? What about halides? If halogens are oxidizing agents, what about halides? Good. These are reducing agents. Good. Okay. Why? Because they can give an electron away. So take an electron away to form X2. Okay. And yes, Rasev, that was my next question. I is the strongest one. That's the daddy on this side. Because why is it really good at reducing other things? Well, it's got an electron. It's gained from somewhere in the past. Um, but it's actually quite good at letting it go. It's kind of like, yeah, I've got an extra electron. I'm I minus at the moment. Um, but the thing is, because there's a massive amount of shielding, it's really far from the nucleus. Oh, you want this electron? Yeah, you can have that electron. It's like hardly holding on to it. It's like just about barely holding on to that extra electron. So it's just like, you know what? You want it? You can have it. And it just, it reduces other things really, really easily. That's it. So it's the, it's the increased radius, not the radius of the nucleus, the nucleus radius that we don't get into that at all. It's the, the radius of the entire ion. So it's got the greatest ionic radius because it is an ion, um, high amount of shielding, weak attraction between the nucleus and outer electron. Therefore, it loses it really, really easily. Okay, really, really easily. So um, there are reactions of group seven that you guys need to know as well. All right, so um, let's... It's. It, Let's talk about, what should we talk about? Let's talk about chlorine, reactions of chlorine. So Cl2 and H2O. This is a reversible reaction. What do we get, please, ladies and gentlemen? I think you all need to know this reaction. Chlorine and water, what's the reaction we're going to get? What products do we get? Oh, we're going to talk with displacement tomorrow with redox, yeah? Good. Not ClO plus H2. It's HCl and yeah, HClO. Good. Okay. HCl and HClO. So that is one, two. Yeah, that's it. It's balanced. Okay. So this is uh, hydrogen chlorate one. Where's the one come from? Why is it hydrogen chlorate one? HClO is in bleach. 
It is ah yeah you you kind of T boy you're on there as well yeah it's the oxidation number oxidation state of chlorine in that okay it's the oxidation state of chlorine in that so that's hydrogen chlorate one okay um, so that's a really important reaction that you guys need to know another important reaction of chlorine is with sodium hydroxide let's call this cold and dilute aqueous sodium hydroxide what are we actually making here. Yes, it does absolutely identifies the oxidation state. So what, pray tell, are we going to make here with cold dilute sodium hydroxide? Good. We're going to make NaCl and NaClO. So this time it's sodium chlorate one. And for the same reason, that one is there giving you, um, uh, giving you that uh, product. And of course, H2O. So that's what we've got there. And what we've got, do we need that? Yeah, we do, there. No, that's wrong. Do we get H2O? Yeah, we must get H2O. Help me balance this, guys. My brain's gone dead. You do get it, don't you? H2O. Ah, there we go. 2NaCl. Duh. Okay, 2NaOH, 2NaCl. Okay. I've done this too many times. My brain's playing tricks on me. <laughs> so that's that one. Now, some of you, some of you need to know the reaction between chlorine and sodium hydroxide with um, hot concentrated sodium hydroxide not all of you i believe it's edexcel do need to know um but there are three chlorines on the right then you're right there damn it it's balanced before without the two nacl yeah, it was. Yeah, two NAs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> like I said, questioning myself. Right, what are we getting here? Whoa, Aisha. Yep, yeah, so this time, not HCl. We don't get a, a HCl. Good, you get NaCl and NaClO3, okay, which is sodium chlorate what chlorate five okay good sodium chlorate five uh, and of course we get h2o here so we need to do some proper balancing and uh, so we need those no it's more than two isn't it it's four i believe o3 and h2o so we need four of those and that's balanced One, two, three, four. Yeah. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah. We're all good. Four. Uh, Raseb, no, I don't think so. It's not for AQA. I know it is for EdXL, I believe. Okay. That need to know that. Maybe. Maybe OCR. OCR people. And three CL2. Uh, no. We don't need three Cl2. We've got two chlorines on the right-hand side there. Okay. So, yeah, so there's some general um, equations there for chlorine. Again, there are um, other specific ones, okay? There's four on the left and two on the right. Yeah, that is true. So we'll need... I need to not affect that. So what if it's that and that? Four chlorines, one, two, three, four. Damn it. Come on, Rich. Why can't you balance these equations? <laughs> what a brain fart today. You looked at the solution, it makes no sense. 
What makes no sense, Zane? Maybe that's wrong. Three CL two five on OH. Okay, fair enough. So it's five. Six and ACL. Three H two O. One, two. No, it can't be three H two O because I mean these six hydrogens. We haven't got six hydrogens. We've only got five on the left hand side there. <laughs> Same. Have you lost the plot, Zane? <laughs> okay. Anyway, we'll balance that at some point, okay? Let's stay on topic, shall we please, Zane? Um, so, moving on. I'm over that. I'm not going to sit here and just... It's not worth your time me start trying to balance that off the top of my head, okay? Uh, three water, three CL2, six NUH. Okay, three, six, five, three. Three, six, five, and three. Yeah, that looks right to me. Boom. So really importantly, solubility rules. A lot of people forget about this. Um, and in terms of the, um, the test for ions and things like that. So we're going to cram this in really, really quickly, okay? So let's go with group one salts. So whether it's potassium nitrate, potassium hydroxide, lithium carbonate, whatever, what can we say about all the solubility of all group one salts? All oh, right, okay, Ibrahim, that's fine. Like I said, it's different for different exam boards. So for me to cover everything, it'll just get really confusing for everybody, okay? Not solubility increases down the group, doesn't increase down the group. Nope, group, all group one salts, all soluble. Never in a million years will you get a precipitate of a group one salt. Everything's soluble. Pick a group one and stick any negative ion on it, it's soluble, okay? So all group one salts are soluble. Group two, salts, there are some rules, okay? We need to talk about um, group two uh, halides. We need to talk about group two hydroxides. We need to talk about sulfates, and we need to talk about carbonates. So group two halides, all soluble. Group two hydroxides, as you go down the group, they get more soluble, okay? They get, it's really important this. As you go down the group, they get more soluble. So solubility gets higher. So hydroxides increase down the group. Sulfates decrease down the group. Their solubility goes down as you go down the group, okay? So it, uh, basically, sulfates smaller, okay? So all halides are soluble. Hydroxides increase down the group, so hydroxides higher, a little bit of alliteration there in terms of solubility. Sulfates smaller, again, alliteration, sulfate smaller there, solubility decreases going down the group. Boom, T-boy, carbonates can't, okay? So all insoluble. So you can have a group two carbonate, anything, and carbonates can't. They cannot dissolve, okay? So when you're looking for precipitates in tests, that's really important. In fact, um, another one, let's go with, um, halide salts in general. Okay. They are all soluble except which two, what two metals are insoluble when they form a halide salt? Boom, T-boys, silver. So except silver and the other one. It would get a bright yellow precipitate with the iodide of it. Oh, babe, teen, lead. Okay, silver and lead. All right. So silver, of course, is our test for halide ions. All right. Silver nitrate is our test for halide ions. Can it dissolve in organic solvents? Uh, no. 
because organic solvents are non-polar. So any salts will be insoluble in organic solvents. I mean, um, maybe in ethanol. Um, I don't know. It's not on the spec. Um, they wouldn't ask you a question on that, basically. All right. Um, another one for me is nitrates. That's really important. What can we say about all nitrate salts? Yeah, we can look at tests for group seven. I th no, we're running out of time. Good. All soluble. All soluble. Every single one. Okay. So you can have anything nitrate, lead nitrate, silver nitrate. Okay. And you'll get a, um, uh, and you'll, you'll get no precipitate. They're all soluble, every single one. Incidentally, in the examulants, I've put the cheat sheets in there for your courses. These are in the year one and the year two cheat sheets that you can print off and put in your folder. All the solubility rules are in there to help you with your ion testing and stuff like that. Oh, 100% it's useful for OCR. You all need to know your solubility rules and testing for ions, okay? So there's some really important tests for ions you've got to know. You've got to know your test for group seven, okay? So that's silver nitrate with your cream, so your white cream and yellow precipitates. And the secondary test, which is are they soluble in ammonia, all right? Um, and then um, what else is there? Oh yeah, barium and sulfate. So a test for sulfate ions is barium. Bear, and uh, the test for barium ions is sulfate ions. So you get a thick white precipitate there, um, which links into obviously barium being at the bottom of group two, pretty much really insoluble sulfate. Okay. Ibrahim, yeah, no example requires you to know solubility rules. This is true, but knowing your solubility rules um, allows you to work out these questions where you have um, things like, you know, these are some results from ion tests. How would you separate these ions out? How do you identify these different ions in solution? So, you know, knowing your solubility rules, no, and I've seen some questions actually as to, uh, I think in the 2019 paper I was just recording, I'm sure it was an AQA one, uh, it was just like, you know, you had to know your solubility rules in order to get the answer to the question, basically, okay? Quoting chem revise. You're coming out here quoting other uh, other resources. Check you out. Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's lots and lots of other things going on. There's lots of other insoluble things, but things you're going to be asked about in year one. Those are the things that uh, you need to know about, essentially. OK, so like I said, all your solubility rules and tests and stuff like that, you can find in that organic cheat, in, not in the organic, but in the year one or um, cheat sheet that's in the examulates. So H2S4 H2S4 and H2S. Oh, right. OK, yeah, that's redox. Let's cover that tomorrow, shall we? OK, so group seven reaction with conch sulfuric acid is a nightmare. And let's cover that in redox tomorrow, shall we? OK. So what I've done within the content guide, if you go in the examulants top section, you'll see links to AQA content guide, Edexcel and OCR content guides. Um, click on those buttons. Look for the little padlock. And there's a little padlock um, on the live sessions. So year one live classes where I've gone through some co common questions for group two and group seven and periodicity. Um, and in the course where you can get uh, access to some of the videos for group two, group seven and periodicity, you can look there as well. So tomorrow we're going to be talking uh, redox. Okay. So we're going to be talking identifying oxidation numbers, what the rules are. You'll find all of those on the cheat sheet I've given you as well inside the uh, examulants. Um, and on Friday, we're talking bonding and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, there's this kind of standard questions they can ask you about bonding. We'll talk about intermolecular forces probably more than anything else because that seems to be people's um, kind of trip wire there in terms of bonding, okay? So, Ben, we are just trying to help. We know you guys have been lumbered, if you like. It's like, oh, no school for three months. And it's like, yay, no, I haven't got a teacher. How am I supposed to finish the content? So this is what we're doing, okay? Um, obviously, our courses are designed to help students like with absolutely everything, okay? Our courses include so much other stuff than what we're doing here on YouTube. Um, but that's up to you. Right now, what we're trying to do is just help you guys finish the spec because we're just nice like that, okay? And we, and we don't want to let any A-level students down. So what we want to do, guys, is spread the word, all right? So if you've got um, uh, any ideas, 
um, on how to how to reach more year 12 students, please just share, um, you know, the fact that we're doing this. All right. Let your friends know, let your classmates know. Um, no, these playlists aren't in order of the spec. We've got some other free playlists here on YouTube as well. Um, we're just hitting some of the major topics as best we can to help you guys finish the spec. So that's the uh, that's what we're doing, okay? So um, check out the content guide from the Examulance, all right? And um, I will see you tomorrow where we're going to be doing some Redox Year 13s in the next hour. We're going to be looking at some questions on the rate equation and the Arrhenius equation. So um, we'll have some fun with that. So those year 13s, I'll see you in about nine minutes or so. Uh, year 12s, thank you very much. And I will see you tomorrow.